we start today with the Muhammad Ali preface to the revised edition. There has been a demand for a revised edition of my English translation and commentary of the Holy Quran since the end of the Second World War. Conditions have changed so rapidly since I first took this work in hand in 1909 that I myself felt the need for a revised edition. Well, there could be changes to the English language that make some things appropriate. Um, in fact, it is not only a change of circumstances that called for a revision. My own knowledge of the Holy Book has since increased to a very large extent, owing to the fact that I have been engaged day and night in further research in this line, studying the Holy Quran, the Hadith, and other religious literature of Islam. During this interval of about 33 years, the first edition was published in 1917. I have made substantial contribution to the religious literature of Islam, both in English and in Urdu. After the English translation, I wrote a voluminous Urdu commentary, the Bayan al Quran, in three volumes, and this kept me occupied for another seven years. It extends over 2,500 pages and is much more explanatory than notes in the English translation. During the same period, I also wrote A Life of the Holy Prophet in Urdu, which was later translated into English under the name of Muhammad the Prophet. A little later was issued a history of the early caliphate, both in Urdu and in English. About the year 1928, a smaller edition of the English translation without Arabic text and with briefer notes was published. Then came the translation and commentary in Urdu of the Sahih Bukhari, the well-known Hadith collection. In 1936 was published another voluminous work in English, The Religion of Islam, which contains full information on almost all Islamic questions relating to doctrine or practice, and casts full light on all Islamic questions of modern days. The New World Order, a manual of Hadith, and the living thoughts of the Prophet Muhammad were added after 1940. Owing to the extensive study which I had to make for these writings, I myself felt that I had received more light and was bound to give the English reading public, which extends over a vast period of the world, a deeper insight into the Holy Quran than I had given in my younger days. I began the work of revising the translation and commentary of the Holy Quran in some time late in 1946, but the year 1947 was a critical year for the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent, and on the 29th of August, 1947, I myself had a flee for my life from Dalhousie, where I used to work in the summer months. The literary work that I was doing there suffered considerably, but I took it up later at Quetta, where I passed the summer of 1948. Before making much progress, however, I felt I fell seriously ill, and the work had again to be put off for more than six months. The manuscript was ready by the middle of 1950, but another serious illness overtook me at Karachi, where I was then carrying on this work. I was spared, however, by God's grace to see the work through the press and to give it the finishing touches. Uh, perhaps also to render some further service to the cause of truth. Though still on my sickbed, I am able to go through the proofs and revise the introduction. Before stating what changes I have made in the revised edition, I quote a few paragraphs from the old preface relating to the chief features of this translation. As regards the translation, I need not s say much that a need was felt for a translation of the Holy Book of Islam with full explanatory notes from the pen of a Muslim, in spite of existing translations, is universally admitted.
whether this translation satisfies that need. Only time will decide. I may, however, say that I have tried to be more faithful to the Arabic text than all existing English translations. And I think I pointed out some examples where um, the translation, where it wasn't quite translated, you could say, um, when I presented this. It will be noticed that additional words as explaining the sense of the original have generally been avoided and were necessary, and these cases are very few. They are given within brackets. Wherever a departure has been made from the original, our primary significance of a word. Reason for this departure has been given in a footnote, and authorities have been amply quoted. There are some novel features in this translation. The Arabic text has been inserted, the translation and the text occupying opposite columns. Each verse begins with a new line in both the text and the translation, and the verses are numbered to facilitate reference. Necessary explanations are given in footnotes and serial numbers, and generally either authorities are quoted or reasons given for the opinion expressed. This made the work very laborious, but I have undertaken this labor to make the work a real source of satisfaction to those who might otherwise be inclined to skeptical, uh, to be skeptical regarding the many statements which will appear new to the ordinary reader. I have tried to avoid repetition in the explanatory footnotes by giving a reference where repetition was necessary, but I must confess that these references are far from being exhaustive. When the significance of a word has been explained in one place, it has been thought unnecessary, except in rare cases, to make a reference to it. For the reader's facility, I have, however, added a list of the Arabic words explained, and the reader may refer to it when necessary. Besides the footnotes, ample introductory notes have been given at the commencement of each chapter. These introductory notes give the abstract of each chapter in sections at the same time, showing the connection of sections and also explaining that of different chapters with each other. This feature of the translation is altogether new and will, I hope, in course of time, prove of immense service in eradicating the idea, which is so prevalent now, that there is no arrangement in the verses and chapters of the Holy Quran. It is quite true that the Quran does not classify the different subjects, and treat them separately in each section or chapter. The reason for this is that the Holy Quran is not a book of laws, but essentially a book meant for the spiritual and moral advancement of man. And it's not some chronological history, it's not some history book too, so it's not going to come off like that. And it's not poetry and prose, so it's not going to come off like that. So um, it's something to itself. And if we had the original of other scriptures, I think we'd have a lot more of that phenomenon being noticed. Um, and if you look at the Vestan and the Sanskrit text and parts of the Psalms, um, a lot of the Bible is actually worse written outside of English. Um, well, I mean, it's older versions, but I, I mean in terms of the uh, certain things. But anyways, um, well, particularly when you get and what they call the New Testament. But, and therefore, the power, greatness, grandeur, and glory of God is its chief theme. The principles and social laws enunciated therein being also meant to promote the moral and spiritual advancement of man, but that there exists an arrangement will be clear even to the most superficial reader of the introductory notes on these chapters. It will be further noted that the Meccan and Medinan revelations are beautifully welded together and that there are groups of chapters belonging to about one time and relating to one subject. The introductory notes also show whether a particular chapter was revealed in Mecca or Medina and also the probable period to which it belongs, exact dates and specified order of the revelation of different chapters are often conjectures and therefore I have avoided this useless talk. The references to the authorities quoted in the notes are explained in the list of abbreviations given on page 60. Among the commentators, I have made the greatest use of the voluminous commentaries of 
Ibn Jarir, Imam Fakr, Aldin Rasi, Imam Athir, Aldin Abu Hayyan, and the shorter but by no means less valuable commentaries of Zamakshari, Baydawi, and Jami al Bayan of Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir, as much as people make issues of it, there's, there's what, like five issues in the book that we can say are objective fallacies? That's not much for a book that size. Um, a conservative book in particular. Um, name a Western book that's anywhere, you know, that's half that size. It doesn't answer that many problems. They're conservative comedy. Among the lexicons, Taj al-Arus and the Latin al-Arab are one volume of standard works and have been freely consulted, but the smaller work of Imam Raghib Isfahani, known as Mufradat il Gharib al-Quran, has afforded immense help, and it undoubtedly occupies the first place among the standard works in Arabic lexicology. As far as the Quran is concerned, the valuable dictionaries of Hadith, the Nahaya of Ibn Athir, and the Majma al-Bihar have also proved very serviceable in explaining many a moot point. I will, however, be noted that I have more often referred to Lane's Arabic-English lexicon, a work of value of which, for the English student of Arabic, can hardly be overestimated. This has been done purposely, so that the reader of the volume may have facility to refer to an easily accessible work. An easily accessible work. It is a pity that the great author was not spared to complete his work, but up to the former, Fa, Lane has placed the world under the greatest obligation Besides commentaries and lexicons, historical and other works have also been consulted. Among the collections of Harith Bukhari, Kitab al-Tafsir, our chapter on the commentary of the Holy Quran, has been before me throughout. But the whole of Bukhari and other reliable Hadith collections have also been consulted. And lastly, the greatest religious teacher of the present time, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian, you know, because he's considered a prophet by the sky, um, which Islamically and otherwise, we kind of could go into why that wouldn't be the case, has inspired me with all that is best in this work. I have drank deep at the fountain of knowledge, which this great reformer, now, if you see problems and you're a good scholar and stuff like this, this isn't, you know, we can give him some merit for a lot of that, right? Um, I mean, acknowledge that there was some good work done there. Uh, Mujaddid of the present century and founder of the Ahmadiyya movement has made to flow. Now, the uh, Muwahideen have likewise claim they're scholars of the century sort of thing. Um, whether that matches the actual um, narration, the individual that's being talked about there or not, that's... Um, there is one more person whose name I must mention in this connection, the late Malawi Hakim Nur Adin, who, in his last long illness, patiently went through much the greater part of the explanatory notes, and made many valuable suggestions. To him, indeed, the Muslim world owes a deep debt of gratitude as the leader of the new turn given to the exposition of the Holy Quran. He has done his work and passed away silently, but it is a fact that he spent the whole of his life in studying the Holy Quran and must be ranked with the greatest expositors of the Holy Book. The principle of the greatest importance to which I have adhered in interpreting, interpreting the Holy Quran is that no word of the Holy Book should be interpreted in such a manner as to contradict 
the plainer teachings of the Holy Quran, a principle to which the Holy Word has itself called the attention of its reader in 36-387. Oh, page 307. Okay. This. You know, Surah 3, A at 6, for some. Um, this rule forms the basis of my interpretations of the Quran. And this is a very sound basis if we remember that the Holy Quran contains metaphors, parables, and allegories side by side with plain teachings. The practice, sunat, and sayings of the Holy Prophet, when contained in reliable reports, are the best commentary of the Holy Word. You know, after the Quran comments on it, on itself on the same issue, right? Um, because that would have been the inspiration, which is actually more than what most paths kind of focus on. People get ideas and, oh, a good person would follow this path. Well, that's not the same thing as the inspiration. Um, and I had, therefore, attached the greatest importance to them. Earlier authorities have also been respected, but reports and comments contradicting the Quran itself cannot but be rejected. And a lot of these comments, as I'm saying, is, is why people take issues with Islam. It's not what the Prophet said. It's not what was revealed. It's side notes that have maybe didn't have issues at the time. Sometimes uh, later we figure out that they did have issues. Um, or issues arose that weren't part of the more direct material. I have also kept before me the rule that the meaning to be adopted in any case should be that which suits the context best, and the only other limitation to which I have subjected myself is that the use of the word in that sense is allowed by the lexicons or by Arabic literature. Existing translations have rendered me great help, but I have adopted an interpretation only after fully satisfying myself and having recourse to original authorities. Many of the stories generally accepted by the commentators find no place in my commentary, except in cases where there is either sufficient historical evidence or the corroborative testimony of some reliable sayings of the Holy Prophet. Many of these stories were, I believe, incorporated into Islamic literature by the flow of converts from Judaism and Christianity into Islam. A lot of it's because when people say Sunnah or Hadith, who's Sunnah or Hadith? So if people talk after Muhammad died, whether they knew the Prophet or not, it's not the same thing as the Prophet saying it. And some of these people talked about the leg uh, legends of the others, and people just say, oh, well, we can't tie it to the Prophet, but we have found um, some of the companions relating to these things, so... I must add that the present tendency of Muslim theologians to regard the commentaries of the Middle Ages as the final word on the interpretation of the Holy Quran is very injurious and practically shuts out the great treasures of knowledge, which an exposition of the Holy Book in the New Light reveals. Now, there's constant more science, and um, when it comes to different psychological uh, understandings, it's not that you know, the information isn't already out there. Um, but, you know, we have we have people that are, you know, 